Why we love the Tang Dynasty, exploring the unique charm of what's seen by many as the greatest imperial dynasty in Chinese history. Episode 9 The Assimilation of the Hu. In this episode, we'll be discovering how the great fusion of peoples during the Tang Dynasty set the scene for modern China's ethnic and cultural diversity. I'm Bob Jones. And in this podcast series, we'll be getting to know the Tang Dynasty and attempting to discover how, at its height, it became possibly the most powerful, interconnected and innovative country in the world, with a rich and influential legacy that survives even to this day. When we talk about China today, it's tempting to imagine that it has always been the way it is now throughout history in terms of size, territory, ethnic makeup, language and culture. Today, it's a country of more than 1.4 billion people, almost 20% of the world's population and climbing. The most populated country in the world, 60% of whom live in cities and covering an area of some 9.6 million square kilometers. Those statistics hide astonishing diversity and influence that spreads well beyond its borders. Just witness the annual two sessions parliamentary meetings. While the Han Chinese make up 90% of the country's population, there are 55 distinct and celebrated minority ethnic groups in China, each still enjoying their own costumes, festivals and cultures. And so it was in the time of the Tang dynasty. We know a lot about the population makeup of the Tang because they created an accurate census, as always in these cases, to make sure that everyone paid the right taxes, but also for military conscription. Early on, they set up a grain and cloth tax at a relatively low level to encourage people to pay something, anything. This was in contrast to earlier generations where many people were taxed beyond their capability to pay. So, we know from a census carried out in 609 AD, just a few years before the establishment of the Tang Dynasty, there were an astonishing 9 million households, representing 50 million people. That figure was fairly static, and it didn't begin to leap ahead until the following Song Dynasty, when innovations in agriculture boosted economic growth. At its peak, the Tang capital was the largest city in the world, with about 2 million residents in all. As we learned in an earlier podcast, it was highly cosmopolitan, with the streets filled with faces from, amongst other places, Persia, Central Asia, Japan, Korea, Vietnam and India. One important group at this time were the nomadic Hu people to the north. And who exactly were the Hu? At the time of the Tang, the term was used for anyone from the northern nomadic horse-riding tribes of the Central Asian Plains. They were the ancestors of the Xianbei, Kitan and Mongol peoples. It is said that their name comes from the Chinese word Ro, which means meat. Initially hunter-gatherers, archaeologists have, however, discovered they were also traders. Perhaps more importantly, they were reputed to be great warriors, which made them good people to have as friends, and not so good to have as enemies. They were attracted to the Tang because of its wealth, culture, safety, and this meant many Hu people left the land and travelled, first living among the Han people, and then intermarrying, and then being assimilated. There are many clues pointing to this trend. Several members of the ruling Tang dynasty were a mixture of ethnicities. 
Some academics have suggested that a tenth of all the Tang prime ministers could trace their ethnic origins to the Hu. There are chapters in the Book of Tang dedicated entirely to the prowess of non-Han generals within the military. By far the most prominent sign of Hu-Han integration was intermarriage and all the cultural implications that came along with it. We see this from rare artifacts found in tombs, little figurines or pottery with decorations showing culturally different women in a family setting. And in documents also, there are sometimes references to people with non-Han names. We've noted before that written history is often about kings, politicians and soldiers and rarely about women in society. And so the stories about how some of these Hu women reached Tang, fell in love and married is largely untold. But we can guess. Some came to Tang as tributes from nearby Central Asian countries. Often these countries sent jewellery, horses, leopards, lions. But also women. Records show that over 150 years, the Hu people paid tributes to the Tang no less than 94 times, most usually offering wine, women and song. Others came as slaves or servants to merchants travelling along the Silk Road. Some were sold off en route or became pregnant, married and had families, adopting Han names as they went and subsequently disappearing into the background of history. Another possibility is that they were simply the descendants of Hu immigrants who had come to settle. The importance of all this speculation is that, far from being spurned by the Han people, migrants, slaves, incomers and tributes alike, along with their cultures, were welcomed, embraced and assimilated during the Tang dynasty. But of course, the Hu were not the only ethnic group to add to the diversity of Tang China. Once again, we need to turn to archaeology for our clues. A tombstone was discovered in Shaanxi province, which belonged to a famous Tang general, Li Yuanliang. He was a Persian who came to China after his homeland was invaded by Arab forces. He was not alone, and many Persians, including noble families, came to Tang for safety, where they intermarried, integrated, and ultimately became assimilated. In 1955, a Zoroastrian tomb was discovered in modern-day Xi'an. The epitaph was engraved not only in Persian script, but also in Chinese, showing a high level of integration. People were bilingual. Artifacts also suggest people came from further afield, as far as Africa, the Malaysian Peninsula and the South Pacific Islands. But back to Hu Han integration. How did this play out in practice? Can we still see evidence of the Hu people in the customs, clothing, food and culture of China today? And how much did it go the other way, with Han habits dominating the lives of the Hu and beyond? The people of the Tang Dynasty loved a good time. Exotic costumes, foods, singing, dancing, acrobatics, but also different beliefs, all of which were embraced by the Han majority. The Hu literally raised the bar when it came to furniture and housing, introducing higher chairs and tents to their new hosts. In also came thoroughbred horses, cattle, incense, rhinos, spices, glass and ostriches. Architectural design, generally, also took leaps forward. Emperor Xuanzong of Tang imitated the palace design of Byzantium, introducing an early form of air conditioning, whereby a water wheel cast spray across the palace walls to keep the house cool. Argarwood, sandalwood, musk, frankincense and mud were smeared on walls, herbs and spices added a fragrance to homes as one entered. There are several other examples of building technology being welcomed, which show crucially that integration was far more than bringing peoples together, and that the Tang people were happy to learn from the countries and peoples they came into contact with, and implemented innovations they encountered along the way. 
clothing, too, was greatly influenced by the customs of the western regions. There's even one story which notes that a criminal in Chang'an wore a hoodie to make his escape, making it hard to identify him later. Such hooded hats were imitations of Persian silk designs. Hu clothing was often practical and harked back to the times when they rode horses across the plains. It was readily adopted by Tang people, many of whom relied on horses to travel about. And unusually, in the history of China, women were just as much riders of horses as men. Another influence of the Hu. But let's not forget the all-important food. There are records which show the nobles of the Tang dynasty served Hu-style food, which was glutinous rice, ginger rice, honey cake and flax cake, and of course wine. Plenty of wine, which was usually imported because the Tang weren't that skilled at making it. So, what have we learned? that there is plenty of evidence to show that the Tang dynasty was more than happy to absorb and assimilate the lifestyles and loves of the countries around it, especially if it involved fun and technological innovation. It was a world view that didn't stop with the Tang though. Tang society was a magnet for ideas, innovation, both physical and mental, but it was very definitely a two-way street. In fact, a two-way motorway thanks to the remarkable communications network that developed during the time of the dynasty, and it's a trend that has continued very much to today. While the Hu people were very visible in Tang literature and culture generally, in later generations they disappeared from sight, or rather they simply became Chinese. Special thanks go out to San Lian Zhengdu for their help in creating the content for this show. This is Bob Jones. Thanks for listening. Join me again next time.